Good morning. Welcome to this gathering at Spring Creek Christian Church. My name is Pastor Jeffrey Hayes. Grace and mercy to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. We assemble here this morning to grow in our knowledge of God through his word so we might stand firm and take action against those forces that are seeking to eliminate the true biblical worship of the Lord Jesus Christ in the church. Because we know that when you plant your life in the word of God, you will flourish even in the face of persecution. To that end, I start us off with Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. This is Jesus speaking to the church of Smyrna. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. And you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let us pray. Father, we bow down before you in awe, in a holy fear, as we recognize your power over all things, even evil. Uh, We are grateful, dear God, that you reveal to us in your word that you are sovereign and that you are with us. We pray, Father, that you would lead us to repent of any unconfessed sin in our life, anything we've said or done or not said or not done this week that contradicts your character and disobeys your word. We thank you for forgiveness through faith in Christ. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are still saving people from their sin. And we pray, Father, that as a result of worshiping you today as a church, we would grow in our knowledge of you through your word, that we would become strong, and we would have confidence and capabilities to take action against those forces that do seek to eliminate the true worship of you. We pray all these things in the all-powerful name of your Son and our Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen. According to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, 70 million Christians have been martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus in the history of Christianity. What's even more important to realize is that over half of those Christians who have been martyred for the faith, their deaths occurred in the 20th century under communist and fascist governments. Over half. Today, Open Doors Ministries reports that 322 Christians are martyred every month for claiming Jesus Christ as Lord. That is sobering to consider. That is courage in the face of persecution. In the section of scripture that we're going to study today, the despicable ruler Antiochus IV turns his fury not against Egypt, not against Rome, but against the Jews, against God's chosen people. And we're going to see today that the things that Antiochus is allowed to do to Judaism and to the Jewish people can only be described as despicable, contemptible, worthless in the eyes of God. And as we go through this text and as we see what he does and as we recognize that Antiochus is just a forerunner, he's just a sample or an overture of the Antichrist that is to come, it it begs the question, why? Why would God allow this despicable ruler to do this to his people? Why? Why does God allow this? After all, Israel was just stuck in the middle. And that why question is going to be very, very important. I don't mean to beat a horse into the ground, but if the Lord should allow a despicable ruler to ever become president of the United States, how will you answer the question as to why? Why would he allow it? And if this despicable ruler should just so happen to turn against the church, true church, Christianity in any way, which I'm sure he or she will, how will you answer the question as to why? It may not be in our generation, it may be your kids, it may be your grandkids, when they come up to you and say, Grandma, Grandpa, why is God allowing this happen? Why is the God that you have followed for X amount of years allowing this man to do this to us? 
you have to have an answer. Otherwise, you will default to, I don't know. And that is not faith. You know, it's not as if God is ever overcome by evil. It's not as if God would be caught unaware by these evil people who come into power. And it's not as if God doesn't care what he allows despicable rulers to do to his people. So why does he allow it? That's a question we seek to answer today from the word of God. Why does God allow the despicable ruler? Why does the Lord permit the contemptible leader? Would you open up your Holy Bible to Daniel chapter 11, verse 29? Daniel chapter 11, verse 29. And would you please rise in honor of the word of God? I'm preaching from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, if you need it, to bring it up on your phone. There are also a few Bibles available in front of you. This is Daniel chapter 11, verse 29. It says to us, At the appointed time he will return and come into the south, but this last time it will not turn out the way it did before, for ships of Kittim will come against him. Therefore he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. By smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who have insight, insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join them in hypocrisy. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. Amen. Please be seated. Why does God allow the despicable ruler? Why does the Lord permit the contemptible leader? Big key word right off the start in verse 29, appointed. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south. At the set time, at the determined time. He's going to have on his heart to take action. Who's appointing? Who's setting? Who's determining? Yahweh Elohim. So at some point, Antiochus Epiphanes gets on his heart that he's going to go back to Egypt. He didn't get it all. Remember, he wanted all of the nation. He didn't get it all. He's going back. We're told by God that this last time he goes, he will not turn out the way it did as it did before. Why? Verse 30, for ships of Kittim will come against him. Kittim is a, another name for Cyprus. And who's in Cyprus right now but Rome? So Egypt sees Antiochus and the Syrian army coming from the north. And rather than try to battle him by themselves this time, they get smart and they say, um, Hello, Rome. Can we sign a contract with you where you will help us defeat these guys? So the Roman navy comes from Cyprus, Cyprus and stops Antiochus. History tells us that they gave, the Roman uh, leaders gave Antiochus their terms of agreement. He had to give up everything, pay so much money again. Antiochus' response was, well, I need to go talk to my leaders so you may have heard this story, but the, the, lead, the Roman leader drew a circle with his sword around Antiochus and said, I need your answer by the time you step over that line. Antiochus knew he couldn't defeat Rome, so he surrendered. Therefore, he was disheartened. He's discouraged. For the first time, he has been totally, not first time, uh, he has been ransacked. He's been pushed away from his true desire once again. He's disheartened. He returns home. He just goes home back to Syria. But what happens? He becomes enraged. Literally, he foams at the mouth. Remember, he, named, he was nicknamed, not Epiphanes, but Epimenes, madman. He was probably truly psychotic. He's foaming. He is enraged. But who does he get enraged at? Not, in, not Rome, not Egypt, but at the Holy Covenant this sacred promise that God gave to the Jewish people. 
that if they obeyed the Mosaic law, specifically the Ten Commandments, he would bless them. He would give them all this land. And so God allows his heart to be turned over to hating the Jews. This is not a new satanic trick. <laughs> this is the theme for the Jewish people. It happens time and time and time again. You see it in our world today. Anti-Semitism is on a rise in our own college universities. Why? It's demonic. So Antiochus is enraged at the Holy Covenant. And he doesn't just sit there and stew about it. He's going to take action. He's going to accomplish something. What is that? He comes back to Israel. He comes back to the promised land. And this guy is a total flatterer. Who does he seek out? Those who forsake the Holy Covenant. It says he's going to show regard for those who forsake it. He's going to buddy up. He's going to put into his pocket. He is going to share allegiances and information with that group of Jewish people who have let go of the Mosaic Law. They're living in Israel. They identify nationally and ethnically as Jews, but they have no strength when it comes to living under the law, we would call them apostates. They claim to be Jewish, but in their heart, they are not. So this ends up being a big, big group of people. Forces from him, that is an Antiochus, will arise. You've got the apostate Jews who've turned their hearts against Moses and his law. You've got his own Syrian army. And what does he do? The word is desecrate. He profanes, he distorts, he pollutes the sanctuary fortress. We have in here, because of that, that term, not just sanctuary, but sanctuary fortress, that we're talking about not the tent of meeting, but the temple. That holy, sacred place that God has designated on earth, that this is where the Jewish people are to worship me. It was a stronghold. It was not something that could just be pushed over. He pollutes it, these uh, forces, these apostate Jews. He does gross things in there. One of them is to do away with the regular sacrifice. So the word regular there is daily or continuous. Uh, to be a good, faithful Jew, you observe the cultic practices of offering the various times of practices, both according to their calendar and all the festivals, but you know, also when you sinned, you wanted the temple, you wanted that to be a place where you offer sacrifices so you can be forgiven. Antiochus has taken it away. Worse than that, they set up the, abom they set up the abomination of desolation. Talk about a loaded theological term. We've got to spend some time there. Abomination is anything that is abhorrent, anything that is just totally detestable for the sacred space. It's a desolation in that it just appalls people so that they don't want to go there. So you see this grotesque thing that is not permitting Jewish people to even look at it. History tells us he set up a statue of Zeus, but made this, the face of Zeus in the likeness of his own image. So he was encouraging the people to worship the body of Zeus, but the, the image of Antiochus. History also teaches us that one of the things he did was sacrifice a pig on the altar and made the Jews eat pig. So you can imagine, you know, to us, we don't have that in our conscience about bacon or pork. Believe me, I don't. <laughs> to, them, to them, that would have been smearing feces on your Bible. That's how gross that would have been. So you got this statue of Zeus. You've got this gross pig sacrificed on the altar. He's making the Jewish people under force of death eat something that God says is strictly forbidden for his people. The abomination of desolation, if you'll turn to Matthew 24, we have to go here because it is so, so important. The abomination of desolation is something Jesus used uh, to answer the disciples about the end times. This is Matthew 24, 15. Matthew 24, 15. It's referenced explicitly in Matthew and Mark, 
It's an inference in Luke and John. But all the gospel writers picked up on this teaching. When we say Antiochus Epiphanes is just a forerunner of Antichrist, we can have trust in that because Jesus himself saw him as that. Jesus says in verse 15, verse 15 of Matthew 24, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, key word, mark it, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So Jesus is not talking about the same man. But he is using what Antiochus did in Daniel's time as a reference point to say the Antichrist is going to do something so similar. He's going to des um, destroy Judaism. He's going to pervert the religious Judaic faith. So it's his entire pagan spiritual practices that Jesus is referring to about the Antichrist. Namely, he wants to be worshipped as the second member of the evil trinity. You see that, right? You have, you have the beast, you have the dragon of the sea, you have the dragon of the earth. The Antichrist is the dragon of the sea. He is the second member of this evil trinity. He wants all the world to worship him the way the church worships Jesus Christ. So we take from this, number one, that if Jesus says Daniel was a prophet, we can trust that what we get from Daniel is true. It is true prophecy. And we have history to back it all up. He is point, Matthew is painting the picture saying, the reader has to understand this. So the church isn't going to be there. We'll be raptured before the Antichrist at this moment, reveals himself for who he truly is. Jews will be living in that time. They weren't alive when he wrote it. So we suspect that in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew knew that someday there would be readers reading his gospel who are going to need to know this information. He is saying, though, to those Jews, if you're in Judea, you must flee to the mountains. This abomination of desolation happens three and a half years into the tribulation period. At that time, Jewish people have to get out of town. They don't need to get off their housetops and waste any time getting stuff from their house. They need to get to the mountains if they have any hope of surviving the persecution that is to come. If you're in the field, don't get your cloak. If you're pregnant and nursing babies, God help you because you're going to be slower and easier for the Antichrist to pick off. It says if it's on a Sabbath or in winter, that's bad too. Because the apostate Jews are going to think that people who are running on the Sabbath are breaking the law and so they're going to stone them to death. It's going to be awful in the truest sense. So we just can't pass by that term and say abomination of desolation. This is what it means. It has much, much hefty theological weight. Verse 32 back in Daniel chapter 11. So Antiochus now, not Antichrist, but Antiochus is now going to use smooth words to turn, God, to turn godless those who acted wickedly toward the covenant. So it's not enough that this apostate Jewish group sided with him or going to help him. He's going to turn them into his soldiers. He's going to make them totally corrupt and deceive them and give them false teaching. But there's hope. Look at the second part of that verse 32 but the people who know their God the people who have a living live faith in Yahweh Elohim what are they going to do they're going to display strength they're going to be courageous they're going to be overcomers they're going to have power to stand up against this awful circumstance that the Jewish people are in and they're not just going to sit back and talk about it they're going to take action 
they're going to seek to accomplish something. And what is it that they want to accomplish? Well, history teaches us that they want the temple back. So what you have is one priest, Matthias, who had five sons. And these men, maybe you've heard of the Maccabean Revolt. Maybe if you're uh, from a Catholic background, you read the Apocryphal, you see first and second Maccabees. So one of the sons of the five was named Judas Maccabees. After the dad dies, he ends up being this leader. And they attack the Syrian army. They attack this apostate Jewish group, totally outnumbered, because they want their temple. So verse 33, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. So you're going to have some who are able to assess the situation and come up with a strategy and a plan, and they're going to teach the large group that doesn't know what's going on. You know, they're not a part of the apostates, they're not a part of the Syrian army, but they are just overwhelmed with fear. It's a good lesson for us as a church. You know, we suddenly, we see those people who are wanting to get out there and be in front, and we kick them. Go for it. I'll be right behind you. That's this group. So there's two, and there's no shame in that. The few will lead the many, but what happens? They will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many, many days. The first attempt by this small band of people was unsuccessful, but they kept at it. And eventually, uh, eventually they were able to take back the temple. It was an amazing victory for this, this group of guys but it came at a cost. When you see what happened to them, they fell by the sword and by flame. There's a group that's just going to be martyred, that's going to be murdered. There's a second group that's going to be taken hostage and their, their entire wealth, all their livelihood is going to be taken for booty and spoil. Uh, their lives are being risked on the line for the purity of the temple. There's no doubt about it. Verse 34, now when they fall, they will be granted a little help. So the people in the middle, you know, the 80% of the bell curve in the middle are just kind of watching things happen, are saying, all right, I can get with that. I can get with that. But what happens is they join them and they become more of a hindrance than a help. And they just want to be there for protection. They, they, it's sort of like, well, momentum is on their side, so I'm over there. <laughs> but once momentum changes, they go back in the middle and don't end up really helping Verse 35, some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time. This is probably reference to that original group of, of Matthias and his five sons, one of which was named Judas Maccabeus. Um, when it got really hot, they could have bolted. They could have bolted. They did damage to the Syrian army, you know. They, they, they made their point. We were never expected to win the temple back anyway. But basically, they sacrificed their lives for the temple. Rather than fleeing, rather than ducking away from trouble, they ran into sure death. And they did it so that they could get their temple back. And they did it so that the generation after them would remember that some things are worth dying for. And that includes your faith and the way you worship him. So there's a remnant remaining of Israel. There always has been a remnant of Israel. Even though the majority of Jews can't stand Jesus Christ today, there's still people coming. There are Messianic Jews who are putting their faith in Jesus as there will be to the end. So they do this in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end, until Jesus returns. There's going to be this group of Jews that are going to maintain true faith. Why? Because the end is still to come at the appointed time. And do you see what the Holy Spirit did there? Verse 29, what do we start with? At the appointed time. Verse 35, what do we end with? Jesus' return at the appointed time. Everything that happens in between is under God's total control, church. It's hard to stomach but it is. Why then does God allow the despicable ruler? Number one, to refine, purge, and make pure his people until the end. To refine, purge, and make pure his people until the end. Why does the Lord permit the contemptible leader to perfect, purify, and make spotless his people until the end time? To perfect, purify, and make spotless his people until 
the end time. It's right there in the text, right there in that final verse, as I mentioned. God allowed the despicable ruler because he wanted to refine the small group that says, this ain't right. And apart from being persecuted, they probably wouldn't stood up. They probably wouldn't claim their faith as their own. And they probably wouldn't have kept true messianic faith alive and well until the time of Jesus' birth. We recognize, however, that they were able to do this because they had knowledge of God. They were able to stand firm and take action because they truly knew God. The apostate Jews said they did, but not in their heart. God allows despicable rulers, he allows contemptible leaders in the lives of both Jews and the church because it refines us. It separates us, true Christians, from the false. It purifies us, that we are holy, that we are growing in the faith. And it's just one of those spiritual laws that we can't avoid. You grow more in pain and suffering than you do when you're at ease. And the reason is because when we're at ease, we give the appearance that we've got this Christian life all together. But when we suffer and are under the attack of evil, it's the hidden sins that come out. It's the stuff that we don't put on the mask for because we can't hide, we can't wear the mask when we're in pain, right? Ariel Ministries uh, is a, a Messianic Jewish ministry. They seek to share the gospel to Jews and to equip uh, Christians with a messianic perspective on the Bible and they came out with this uh, magazine uh, this spring right when coronavirus hit and it just targeted the Holocaust it was all about the Holocaust and one article in particular struck me it tried to provide a theodicy for the Holocaust so a theodicy theo God uh, DK justification so a justification for God in the face of Hitler killing six million Jews so that's what theodicies are they're answers to the question how can a good and all-powerful God exist when so much evil happens on the earth so this article went through all the areas of systematic theology providing justification for God why God allowed the Jewish people to be killed the way he did by Hitler when it came to eschatology or the end times it was really striking, and it was a thought that just kind of humbled me. It shut my mouth. What, Hitler, what, what God allowed Hitler to do to the Jews is a small taste of what is to come for them. Meaning, the persecution they faced under the Third Reich is a sample of what they experienced under the Antichrist. In other words, he has allowed them to be persecuted, but there is a far worse persecution to come. And when you, when you get your mind wrapped around the Great Tribulation and the focus of the Antichrist's hatred and the carnage of Jewish people that the Antichrist is allowed to put all over the earth, you recognize that the Holocaust is nothing. Six million is nothing compared to what the Antichrist will do in the Tribulation period. And what's, what this article went on to say is, God is going to purify Israel through the Antichrist so that at the end of it, when Jesus comes back, all Israel is saved. The only Jews living when Jesus comes back are those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So Israel is what? Pure. Like Paul says to the Romans, all Israel will be saved. You just don't see it yet. You ask yourself, well, why does God allow the Antichrist to do this? Why, why is he allowing this to happen to Israel? And You know, in the church in the United States, it's, nothing because Israel was given the law Israel was the group of people from which the Messiah came so you know that uh, scripture from whom much much is given much is expected much is due right yeah they rejected it they got the most revelation and they turned away from it the most so God is a just God he can't just let that go oh here's, here's your time out they face what they face in the tribulation because they earned it but at the end of it praise God all Israel will be saved and will be pure. What does this mean for the church? I, I will go here. You don't need to go here. We've got other things to do. But I want you to see some things that maybe you've not seen before. I'm going to James chapter 1. I'm going to James chapter 1, verse 2. It says there, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You don't know how many times I've read that and say, Yeah, Lord, I've had a bad day. And that's not what James is talking about. 
James is talking about the first century church that was dispersed throughout all the world because they just martyred Stephen. So the trials he's talking about is persecution unto death. And he's saying, consider it all joy because the testing of your faith produces endurance, makes, makes, keeps you faithful. As you see, hey, I'm standing up for what is right, even, in, even though it's costing me tremendously. I'll now go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. James is not alone. 1 Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you may be distressed by various trials. Same exact word as James. James says, consider it all, all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Peter says the same exact thing. And it's not because your kids aren't listening to you that day or because you didn't get enough sleep. It's because some civic leader might find out you're a Christian and might kill you for it. Verse 7 gives a payoff. Why should we, why should we uh, rejoice for a little while? So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that there is a true, pure church worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ all the way until the day he comes back. And that is on all of us. It is our responsibility as the generation, this church's generation to make sure that for our kids and our grandkids and however, the Lord, however long the Lord should tarry, there is a biblical example of true biblical worship of the Lord Jesus Christ in the church. Finally, Revelation 2, 9, where I, which I opened the service with, Revelation 2, 9. Jesus is saying to this church, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and they are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. All this to say that the church embraced dying for Christ as a part of everyday living. Now, praise God, we've not had to do that. I'm grateful for it. I'm not saying that we are less than them. I'm saying we've got to make the shift. We've got to make the shift that we are willing to sacrifice and suffer for the church so that there is a pure church available for your kids. Because as you look in our community and you see the various churches, not all are standing firm and taking action. We have to be one of those churches. What does this mean for us? I think the application is, is simple. Be faithful to the Lord in face of persecution by growing in your knowledge of God through the holy word of God so that you can stand firm and take action against those evil forces at, at work in the world today that want to eliminate true biblical worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful to the Lord in the face of persecution by growing in your knowledge of God through the holy word of God so you can stand firm and take action against those evil forces who are seeking to eliminate true biblical worship of the Lord Jesus Christ in the church today. This is not some subtle attack against coronavirus. It's much bigger than that. And the way you stand firm is the way that the Jews did. They had a knowledge of God because they took him at his word. What is special about you is that you hold a literal interpretation of the Bible and a desire to live it from Genesis to Revelation. You're not picking books to live literally and figuratively interpreting the rest. You love the Lord because you take him at his word. That's the church that has a knowledge of God that can stand firm and take action against persecution. Because your faith is rooted in an objective truth that has strength behind it. Not in your experiences, not in what you think, not what your pastor has always said to you. Stand, stand firm for the truth of the word of God and the work of the church in teaching it, knowing full well that you might suffer in generations to come or years to come. What this text teaches us is death is to be preferred over distorting and corrupting true worship of Jesus Christ. Death is to be chosen over kowtowing and giving into enabling or acknowledging distorted perverted worship of the lord jesus christ 
How many of us are there? How many of us care about worshiping the Lord in the church enough that we would die for it for the next generation? I barely want to get out of bed when my kids are crying in the middle of the night. Where the rubber meets the road, I think, is this. Commit yourself to a gathering with the saints every first day of the week because you recognize persecution is coming, because you recognize you need to grow in your knowledge of God so that you can stand firm and take action against those forces. It is the lone sheep that the devil preys on. It's not the flock. Got that? We preach, we teach the word of God, gather with the saints every first day of the week. It's an hour and a half, y'all. As a way to say, I am part of the few with insight. I am part of the few that's going to have knowledge to lead the way forward. Let's set some limits. We're going to stand firm for the word of God, but we're not going to be big mouth boastful arrogance and going out on Facebook and picking every fight we want. We're not looking at the culture and seeing everything that we don't like and just blubbering what we think is right. We're standing for the gospel. We're standing for truth of the word of God, and we're being courageous to deal with people face to face. The Church of Jesus Christ has been commissioned to make disciples of all nations even under the government of civic authorities who might seek to eliminate Christian values in the Christian worldview. There's no small print under the Great Commission. If it gets too hard, that's okay, you can stop. It's not there. The church that stops gathering together to get equipped with the word so they could go out and evangelize the lost is the church that fails the Lord. So commit to gathering with the assembly of the saints every first day of the week, not because I'm the great greatest preacher not because you leave here totally uh, blessed all the time because you recognize that it shows force and you know you need to grow in the knowledge of God and the only way you're going to stand firm for whatever God allows to come and take action against it is because you are growing in that knowledge and you have a band of people that you can look to for support so that if ever it becomes too hot to purely worship the Lord in the church, it's not just five of us. It's all of you who are going to take back the church for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll put together a subtle plug where, you know, the small group ministry, small group fair is coming up. Pray considerably. That, that, that's just not a social time, although that's a very important part of it. But if, if something should happen where we have to break up the church into small groups... We've got to be ready to minister to one another, to grow together with one another, to get busy in our lives with one another so that we can take the church underground. So consider uh, joining a small group if you are not in one. Why does God allow the despicable ruler to refine, purge, and make you, pur and make you pure, not only for Israel, but also for you as the church until the end? Persecution is part of God's plan. It is not something the church should be bowled over by. It's something we embrace. It's something we face with strength and action to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.